Hello again, everyone. My name is James Shotwell, and this is Music Biz. It's so good to be with you again. Today, we are doing yet another edition of our long-running Fast Five interview series, only this one runs a little long. So the original plan this week was to speak with Jamie Graham, the head of Unique Leader Records, about how his label has been thriving amid the global pandemic. I mean, let's be honest, we all know everyone was hurt by what happened with COVID-19, especially in the music business. But I've always argued that rock and metal were hit just a little bit harder because unlike other genres, rock and metal groups are typically four, five, six, seven, even eight or nine members deep. And that's a lot of people to try to sustain while you're not able to tour and sell merch in the traditional ways. So Jamie got on the call to talk about that. But we quickly realized that talking about how a record label with dozens of artists and a staff of about a dozen people survived a pandemic takes a lot longer than five minutes to discuss. So this Fast Five actually became closer to a Fast 10, but it's completely worth your time, and I'll tell you why. When the pandemic first happened, for reasons that make absolute sense, Everyone kind of panicked. Releases were shelved, some artist deals fell apart, a bunch of sponsorship deals fell apart, tours fell apart, everyone was in jeopardy. And many labels, hoping to save money and keep their staff, decided to just cut any corner that they possibly could to try to save money. But Unique Leader kind of went a different route. They ended up signing bands. They signed a bunch of bands who they are still pushing through their system right now. They also had about nine to 11 releases that were in various states of pre-order when the pandemic hit, and they found a way to get all of those out there as as well. And through it all, they've continued to develop new talent and seek out new sounds and build their staff and expand their operations, all of which Jamie explains in about 10 minutes in this interview. So I'll stop rambling right now. All you need to know is you're about to hear one of the best minds in heavy music talk to you about what it takes to be successful in metal in 2022. And you get to watch it right now. Let's put five minutes on the clock right now. Okay, Jamie. DMD. It's been a long pandemic for everybody, but I feel like metal bands and heavier labels were hit really hard because those are big groups of people and no one was able to go on tour. So how is how did Unique Leader kind of navigate the last two years to get where you are now? That's a super broad question, obviously, but um, I guess the obvious issue everyone was facing was the lack of tours, you know, not being able to go on the road and actually promote their product actively in in particular markets um so it was sort of a double-edged sword really i think it weeded out the bands that were in it just for sort of casual reasons but still wanted all the things that a full-time band get and then it also gave a lot of bands a huge kick up the ass in terms of putting things into perspective of what they need to do to stand out when tours are removed because mm -hmm. it became all about playlists all about mm -hmm. digital placement marketing um for us, we sort of emphasised more on making sure that the video content that the bands were churning out was consistent and constant, so that there was fresh assets always, you know, outside of just a new song to check out. Um, if bands were able to do live streams, digital, you know, sort of tickets, things like that, we did have a few bands do those as well. Um, but obviously, the proximity issue was always, always there. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd say the biggest, biggest issue was the timeline having to essentially get pushed back. It's like we've gone into a weird scene from Back to the Future and, or Groundhog Day or something. Yes. Um, yeah. In that you had a lot of bands that were scheduled to tour throughout the pandemic. And those tours were either rescheduled for, you know, when everything opened up again, or they've been scrapped and merged with new tours. Or some bands have even had tours fall through completely. Um but obviously there have been releases in the system that have had, you know, dates set for a while or pre-orders might've gone live just before the pandemic started, which was a big one for us. Mm -hmm. um, we had, you know, nine to 11 releases going through the system already by the time March to April kicked in and everything started going haywire. Mm -hmm. Funnily enough, I was actually on tour with uh, like Decapitated and Beyond Creation all that were all on the bus and we just got this, yeah, tours canceled kind of thing. And just, yeah, the instant vibe with everybody was like, holy shit, like what, what happens now, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I've kind of seen it from both like the band's perspective and the label's perspective. And it, it's definitely a case of now who's willing to be a little bit more innovative with their marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I think the standard of videos and content that, that emerges as far as like your frontline assets, you know, your main video for a single 
the digital ads, the Instagram reels, everything has to be super streamlined and of really good standard now um, mm-hmm. for you to, you know, to stand out on this digital world now, because it's not just a question of, or it wasn't a question in that period of who could put on the best live show because there just weren't any. Mm-hmm. Um, you had bands like Trivium who were super smart and basically bought a air hanger and started doing tickets from their, you know, COVID safe concerts and stuff, which is genius. But, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of bands in position where they would be practicing in a rehearsal room or they'd have yeah, club yeah. shows or whatever. And their whole world's got turned upside down because a lot of people would juggle, say, part-time jobs with doing the band or they go back to work and then lose faith in doing the band again or lose motivation. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I think, again, it weeded out those yeah, who yeah. were willing to sort of use that time to create more content and be as proactive as possible and the ones who kind of, you know, either struggled with it for various different reasons. So it is a very general question, man. I mean, just from, no, from the- great. Yeah, <laughs> that's the best. I actually have a follow up for you, though, because you actually hit on what I wanted to get at, which is you had a ton of releases that were kind of queued for release. And I know a lot of bands that found themselves in this position, and some of them are still sorting it out. And mm. I'm curious, you know, as things have started to reopen and now, you know, your timeline kind of gets reset. You have this curious position where all these artists are like we were, you know, a third, two thirds, maybe even, you know, three quarters of the way through a yeah pre-release campaign before the albums all got pushed back so now yeah. there's still a delay but you've already kind of run through the traditional promotional rollout right like we've already heard three singles of the 12 that are on the album how are you guys kind of bridging that gap between like picking up a campaign that kind of died off and then figuring out a way to push it forward again a lot of the time again it's about fresh video assets a lot you know as a first point of call instead mm-hmm. of two or three singles you might have four or five now which seems to be pretty common um as far as keeping momentum going i think that's the ever burning question that every band has and i think the, the key is with this sort of add generation culture as i know it's a very um you know politically incorrect statement to make but people's attention spans are very short when it comes to all the content being thrown at them and all the choices that they have so again i think it's just a consistency thing you know, I think where bands like Lawn Ashore or Distant or Signs of the Swarm or Shadow of Intent have kind of nailed it in the crowded deathcore circuit or Volvodynia as well as a good example is they've used every tool at their disposal from social media to Shopify to label marketing to, mm-hmm. you know, everything in between. Like I said, it's that process of almost weeding out the week. It's like a very Spartan Mm-hmm. thing that's almost been dictated by this pandemic it's like what are bands willing to do other than make good music can they create content that's not just for socials but something that's going to turn into sales and i think label strategies will start looking that way as well i mean we mm-hmm. certainly are it, the focus now is more on creating really good in-house content that we can provide straight away to the bands using their album artwork or really killer merch collections or animated visualizers, videos, you know, alternative reality stuff, whatever it might be. Um, If we can factor that into our existing cost centers and budgets without incurring those to the bands, um, it means they can use their album advances for other things than just, oh, we need to employ this guy to make a visualizer or we need this guy for, you know, we try and take care of that in-house where we can, you know, whenever the bands need something, that's sort of where we've bolstered our staff anyway. But I guess it's going to depend on everyone's model. And for us, it sort of works nicely now because tours are coming back. Um, Everyone's out on the road and a lot of bands do have albums that have been out for a year. So now is the kind of time that we're, looking to extend album cycles somewhat and use it as a time for bands to go, okay, well, we would have released an album in six months had we had stuck to the plan, but now we've got this album we can sit on. There's more time to make, say, five single videos instead of three. There's more time to hit five territories over an 18-month cycle instead of just the US and just Europe with a couple of festivals, which is the usual go-to. But it just depends on the artist and how driven they are and how how much of a position they're in to actually do those things outside of earning a living man. Cause I'm sure I don't need to stress, you know, like the cost of living everywhere seems to just be shooting up like absolutely electricity to food to whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, show guarantees and 
uh, streaming and price per dealer per unit on the physical side and all of the stuff that we actually factor the income into that doesn't seem to be changing much um, other than people's consumption of music has obviously increased because they're spending more time at home but who knows man i wish i had a crystal ball um i've got hunches but that's it well let me give you one last question i know we blew our five minutes but that's fine because you're fine. You can gold. This, i'm sure i'm rather it in oh no you're that. fine you're absolutely fine um my my question on that was i, I agree with you I, I think that for the most part it's kind of cool because of this challenge where everyone had to get more creative but you kind of touched on this a second ago which is the demand for more materials is growing, but not necessarily the budget with to make all of those things. So how are you guys striking a balance between doing more, but not, you know, overextending yourself or overextending the artists through, you know, this increased demand to make more stuff or make higher quality stuff, all that tends to be time intensive. Um, we're using a lot of smart link based campaigns where one link, one click through will serve another. So rather than doing dedicated marketing pushes just for one DSP or one outlet or one product, we'll tend to use a smart link based or algorithmic based click through where you've got multiple retailers mm. and it can discern it by your IP address uh, or by options that you would click on. So that means that we can sort of keep the marketing cost centers a lot more focused per project and you deviate from your budgets a little bit less that way. I think it's a lot easier to overspend when you're starting to test different products here and there. It's like, well, let's just stick them all on a smart link and then see what the uptake is per territory. And then you can actually see where like, for example, Bandcamp might be doing better in Finland than, you know, Deezer's doing a lot better in France, Tidal's doing a lot better in the States. Mm-hmm. you know just figurative examples um but yeah I, it would just be less sort of frivolous okay we're open to anything and here's a extended budget it'd be like well here's what we're planning on spending and if the performance comes back at x we'll spend a little bit more all right one last question for you it's a vague one but I, i'm just curious what your what's your gut answer when somebody asks you this because i assume you're a man that gets this question all the time okay and that is a question that i get which is i am in x kind of heavy band what do yeah. i do to get the attention of a jamie graham um i think it's more about like having you know being almost almost like a, that awful term of like a triple threat or whatever you've got to have the music is the most important thing obviously at the forefront it has to be strong enough to either stand alone by itself as something innovative or if it's not innovative and you're following a formula you have to be so good at that formula that you stand out in that pack because there's a lot of subgenres within metal that are very cookie cutter and a lot of bands sound the same and the subtleties within those bands are often very hard to spot it can be the way a drummer blasts or a certain technique the vocalist uses or just certain things that are important on the musical side. Um, But aside from that, you know, the right attitude and the right understanding of the nature of what they're doing and the industry is always very helpful. Um, Mm -hmm. I think if a band's super green to the market and how it all works, they can sort of have demands down the line or expectations down the line that are just a completely, I don't know, outdated, I guess would be the word. Mm -hmm. Um, By the same token, you have a lot of young bands who need a lot explained to them. So, there might be a lot of lawyer fees involved just to get them to sign a contract in the first place. Um, so I, I guess as far as when we look at bands, it's more a case of like, is there is there need for another band of this type on our roster? Like, do we have enough of these type of bands already? Mm. If so, if it's adding to what we've already got, like, do they stand out in their own right? Um, are they willing to tour? Are they able to tour? Are they not complete dickheads? personally are they are they entitled are they you know deluded there's so many different characters you know it's not just one band either you could have one guy in a band who just fucks it for everybody Mm. so um i think before we even sign a band now we like to sort of chat to them for a while and figure out the people in the band try and get them all on a call rather than just one person or the manager or if it is going through the manager we tend to prod and find out okay, are there any divas? Are there any virtuosos? Are there any kind of bedroom nerds? Like we like to know the the type of band we're dealing with because it often affects the workflow and yeah. 
No, so many yeah. factors, man. That's a great answer, man. I, cause I feel like everyone thinks it's easy. Everyone thinks it's, you know, a great EPK or you no know, X amount of followers somewhere, or they go viral in this one place. And I think you gave the yeah. most succinct version of an answer possible. It, it could be all of those things though, or any one of those things. Um, true. I think that that gut instinct thing is the most important thing. If a band really gets under your skin and you're like, holy shit. Mm-hmm. Um, like for a good example, would be brand of sacrifice. Like when we, when we first signed them, Mm-hmm. I just thought there's nothing else that kind of sounded like that. It, it was like a cross between kind of, if you remember Tony Danza, tap, tap dance extravaganza, they kind of, they were like this Meshuggah yeah, version. Yeah. Love like, that band. <laughs> it was like that crossed with humanity's last breath crossed with just, I don't know, like Oceano or like classic deathcore with this manga themed, you know, they had all these wicked angles and then the ultimate sound even had this sort of, slightly edm influenced thing over it and their vision for the band was great their business ethic was great it was just instantly like holy shit this is a band we need to work with straight away but then you can have the bands who don't know what they're doing initially and they grow into the industry well um i could name a few but i won't but you know there are bands now that are super proficient at what they're doing and when we first took them on they couldn't tell their ass from their elbow you know Oh, I'm aware. We won't, we'll, we'll let them enjoy their success. We'll let yes. them enjoy their success, but asking it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am fully aware of what you are referring to. I wanted to thank you for taking the time to talk to me that you we've blown t- five minutes, but I, I don't care. Did you have fun talking? <laughs> I'm sure you can condense me down into the, uh, the, 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 the smaller version, man. I Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you, you did a great job and I want to thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me, man. Wasn't that great? I want to thank Jamie Graham of Unique Leader for taking the time to talk with me today. I also want to thank Unique Leader's publicist, Lisa Coverdale, for setting this up. She's a longtime Holix user, and I'm a personally a huge fan of her work. If you need any PR work, I recommend Lisa. And lastly, thank you for watching. Music Biz exists to help you navigate the industry. That means having conversations like the one you just watched, but also discussing social media, emerging trends, what we can learn from failures, what we can learn from successes, and a lot more. So if you haven't done so already, go Go ahead and click the subscribe button. Whether you're on YouTube or Spotify or somewhere else, subscribing to Music Biz makes a world of difference in our ability to make you great content. So please do so. And if you have, or if you're just not ready, that's fine too. I do ask one more thing of you. No matter what you do in this life, please take care of yourself because you deserve it.